Hello and welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm Bill Fralick, your host from WTCM Radio News, and it's our weekly roundup of some of the stories that are making headlines here across northern Michigan with some of the journalists that are covering those stories. And this week, to my right, we've got Vanessa Faze from 9 and 10 News. Vanessa, thanks Hello. for coming back. Yeah. And uh, to my left, Jeremy McBain from the Petoskey News Review. Jeremy, thanks for making the trip. My pleasure. Good to see you guys. Uh, we, I guess we'll ease into the news this week by one of the... Uh, I don't know if it's the bigger story, but it's getting all the attention, it seems, in Traverse City. Vanessa, that's the Traverse City Film Festival. Oh, yeah. Lots of attention. Tell us what's going on. Uh, what's what's new this year? The, the biggest thing is the Bijou by the Bay Theater. Um, that was a huge deal for, I think, everyone in Film Fest. And it's a really cool space. Really cool. A little small, but really, really nice space. I think that they did a really good job with it. And it's really unique. It's in, right on the beach. Historic building. Very cool. I trust you You were there for opening night? I was. So yeah. tell me what the opening night party was all about. It was um, packed. I'm pretty sure if they weren't sold out, they were this close to selling out. Um, lots of people there to see what it's like. It's just a completely different feel than the state. It's very beachy, naturally, because it's on the beach. Yeah. Um, and then the party was on the beach after, which was fun for everyone. A lot of people super excited about it. We talked to people standing in line, and I think the historic building thing plays into it a lot. That's what we were getting from a lot of people, especially all the people that have lived here for a long time that kind of knew what the building was before. So it's cool. It's a really cool use of space. What what was the building before? It was uh, the old Con Foster Museum. Um, I think a long time ago it was a, a movie theater. I think, uh, there, yeah, I think originally it was, but they're... Uh in the most recent years when they had the zoo train right. there, that's kind of where they sold tickets was just yeah. in this building and they had paint and you know, photographs on the walls yeah, and that was kind of all there was to it's it. It's been a lot of things I think. Yep. So, Did you, uh, had you covered any of the stories leading up to the opening? Because uh, I know they had a huge volunteer effort this past weekend to get it ready. Yeah, I did, um, I did do a story with Michael Moore about the opening, getting it ready, and he had been saying he was even pushing the broom over there, trying to get it ready in time for the opening night. Um, there was a ton of volunteer effort, which there always is for Film Fest, but especially this year, it was extremely important. And they ended up getting the permit just in time, so it worked out. And then we did do the, the millionth visitor at the State Theater, so that's kind of oh, what okay. we did leading into nice. Film Fest. And I, you know, I want to mention too, we talked about that um, permit to open, you know, we learned this week too that there's a, uh, it's a 30 day permit. It's not entirely done. It's a temporary occupancy permit. So mm -hmm. there still are actually things some things do. that need to be done mm -hmm. um, before they can get that permanent occupancy permit, which uh, I guess I can understand why they didn't come out and say that <laughs> yeah. on Monday when they opened. They uh, had a little different focus, I think, and a little different spin. But uh, tell me about the, the atmosphere. Monday night. I mean, what what was the vibe you got walking into that story? Everyone was so excited. Um, Michael Moore was there, um, his entire team, and tons of people just really, really excited about what it looks like. And again, it's so different that the feel was just everybody was really excited to see this really unique. It's really, there's nothing like it around. So it's it was a very hyped up feel and everybody was really happy with the outcome for now. Yeah, Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you with uh, some of the stories uh, up in, in your neck of the woods. I know everyone is equally excited about fracking in the, in the <laughs> county area. Uh, so tell us what's going on there. I understand there's uh, a lot of uh, potential for, uh, for spaces up in the tip of the mitt. We go from film festival to fracking. I know. So yeah, those they, blend they, they do. Yeah, yeah, they blend so well. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it was it's in Encada. Uh, is uh, there's, there's a lot of um, push right now in uh, in northern Michigan for fracking by this company. But this is I mean, the reason I'm, I'm kind of being a little uh, flip about it is is you know, I've heard this all before. <laughs> you know, yeah. they this is a couple of years ago they had that big uh, those, those land lease sales where. Where uh, they just went through the roof, and and, and and there was all this talk of all these companies coming in, doing all these, all this fracking, and and then it just seemed like a couple months later, nothing happened, and they actually uh, got rid of their leases or you know, uh, uh, reneged on some of the leases and that stuff. So it's kind of, to me, it's it's one of those stories where I'll believe it when I see it, but 
That being said, there's still a lot of concern mm -hmm. um, in, in my neck of the woods over fracking, and rightly so, because you know there's a, there, there are a lot of questions about the practice, um, the type of chemicals that they put into the ground, um, and uh, 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 you know what kind of environmental impact is fracking going to cause? Um, and you know, of course, the industry is you know, they have answers for all of it, and and, and the, all the studies are showing from the DNR. Um, and the industry itself is showing that it's, it's a safe practice, but then you know, the, there's, there's a lot of information on both sides of, mm -hmm. the, of the issue here. A lot of information that we should be concerned about, and as residents of Northern Michigan, we should, we should be looking into and know about. Um, even if it doesn't happen, you know, it, it yeah. just seems to me it's going to happen. We're going to have a lot of, we're going to have some fracking up here. So, um, I, I wonder if part of the delay has been that they're, you know, testing the wells to see if it's you know feasible in each of these areas or I mean obviously I don't know a lot of the the process behind not only making the the land lease deal but then what do you do next to find out if it's really gonna work I imagine there's probably some delay in that there's a lot of land that they've mm -hmm. bought up all over the state Kalkaska County yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so just maybe there's some questions there in the whole process before they even decide to go ahead with it yeah you could be very you know, very right on that. Um, I don't know, uh, but it, it, from the stories that, that we've heard from from residents, um, once the lease was signed, they never heard again from the company. I mean, the company didn't come out and do any testing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. I mean, they they could they could be signing a lease and they and they look at the geography of it. Uh, there's so many things that, that that so many scientific things that I can't even begin to pretend to know <laughs> how yeah, they do yeah. it, but they do. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Another uh, environmental story that I know you worked on this week, uh, biodiesel, a yeah. grant from uh, Michigan State. Tell yeah. us about that story. It was really interesting. There's a, a guy who runs a very small biodiesel company here um, right off of Cass Road, Northwest Michigan Biodiesel, and he just received a grant. Um, he's been doing these little experiments little tiny like lab scale experiments on basically how to make biodiesel with ethanol instead of methanol what that is, I don't really know I just know that ethanol is more environmentally friendly um, so basically he was saying if it it's not toxic so you if it gets dumped into water for example it just biodegrades so he's working on that and the is grant this the, like the corn fuel corn based yeah it's actually yeah, canola oil and okay. sunflower oil is what he's using okay and he has this huge um, warehouse type thing in, off of Cass Road that's pretty new that he hasn't hooked it up yet. They're working on that. It'll also bring about 10 jobs to the area in the long run. So he's gonna start with 20,000 gallons, um, producing 20,000 gallons of biodiesel. And within two years, he's hoping to have a new plant that will produce 500,000 gallons. So it's pretty cool, just something very different. He's the only producer of it right now in the state. Really? Yeah. So does he have potential customers lined up or how he does. does he find that niche? he has been doing this lab scale for eight years and um, I think as he was telling us he was doing these experiments in his kitchen and his son is a plant biologist who worked at Michigan State and graduated from there and said you know why don't you try working with one of the big ethanol labs there and see if you can do that so he did and one of the postgraduates there was like let's apply for this grant so, and he got it, $20,000. So now it'll go towards them researching with him to find new ways to use this the way he wants to produce it. So was this like a hobby of his that he started up or? I think so, yeah. He was a guitar, former guitar maker and um, he ended up getting really interested in it when a friend of his um, was producing it, I believe. And he went to Iowa State and got a degree and now he's got this huge, and he only has one other guy that works with him right now. And if you walk into this warehouse, there's these huge machines. It was really overwhelming. You're like, there's no way. And one of them runs, he said, 24 hours. So he's going to need at least three to four people to hire for just that part. There, it's a lot of science. And it looked like a real lab. And it was, I'm horrible at <laughs> science. But it was really cool. It's, he's a really interesting guy. And he's, I think he's going to go places. He already has, like, um, he was saying he's with fuel producers and things like that, he's going to be distributing it once it's made. But right now he's focused on the harvesting season of canola. So he can use mm. that to make the oil, which 
somehow all makes biodiesel. Nice. Well, kitchen experiments can never go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, another environmental story back up in, uh, well, not just your neck of the woods, but all of our uh, area that affects all of us, some of the funding cuts to the Great Lakes uh, region. And Jeremy, I know you guys have uh, followed that story as well. What's, what's new with the, the federal dollars uh, pouring in or out of the Great Lakes? This is not good. Um, you're talking a massive cut in, in Great Lakes funding for cleanup of the lakes and protection of the lakes. Um, but you know, folks, this is this is this is your government work. This is sequester at work. This is, it's hitting home now. The budget cuts are hitting home now, yeah. um, and this this is a part of them. Um, you're going to feel it. You know, anyone anyone who who takes advantage of the Great Lakes, and that's every one of us who live in the state of Michigan, is going to see the impacts of these cuts if they go through. Um, I know that um, um, our state senators uh, Stabenow and Levin, you know, they're, they're very concerned about it, and um, you know, they're going to—they they're, said they're going to fight against it. Um, Benishek, the, uh, um, uh, the congressman, excuse me, thank you. Um, you know, he's given a "well, we'll take a look at it" approach. Um, we've, we've spoken with uh, various environmental organizations. In Northern Michigan, and they—I don't want to say furious, but they're furious <laughs> about the, about the whole idea. It's just—it's—it's just, it's not good. It's not good at all. Is there are there specifics lined up? Is it too soon to say? I mean, are we talking about really? It's raging, or I mean, it's really too soon to say. I mean, I think I mean they, there are specifics that they've 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 listed out, but it's so. I mean, they're still they're they're still in a lot of a lot of talking stages and. In uh, in Congress, uh, with it, and you know how Congress works is yeah. every hour it seems it seems as though the bill or the proposal is different. So I don't really want to say too much on uh, what the specifics are because they're always changing. Yeah, and that's a good point. And maybe we, um, Vanessa, you can pipe in on this too. But I've always we've always had problems uh, in covering those either national or state stories when they're in those early <coughs> stages of discussion. Because by the time you go to the six o'clock news, or by the time you go to press, something could be different than when you first made that phone call in the morning. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I assume you both experienced that. What's what's your newsroom approach to covering those kinds of stories, and how much in depth can you get in something like this when it's all really theoretical? Well, we get into as much depth as we possibly can. We try and tell the readers, um, here's what the Here's what the impact could be right now, and here's what here's what the proposal is mm -hmm. right now, and you know it's like you're saying right now, because you know we we try and let the readers know this is what it looks like right now, and as much as possible, uh, because a, a more informed reader is a is a is a more uh, powerful voter, a more powerful citizen in our mind. Um, in addition to that, um, we've got a lot of sources uh, in Washington D.C. As well as Lansing, who we talk to, and we say, "Okay, um, this is what the proposal is now. Where do you see it going? What kind of changes do you think need to be made made to the proposal? Mm -hmm. um, or what kind of changes are you going to be pushing for it? Or is it, or is it perfect as it is, which it never is?" Never is. Um, so, by asking those kind of questions of of, you know, of, of our legislative leaders, um, how they want to change it, it gives us a better idea of. Of of how the proposal or the or the subject is going to change over time, and then we give the readers that information too. Now, here's what it is right now. Here's what your elected leaders um, want to do to it, think need to be done to it, or want to you know want to change to it. So that'll give the readers somewhat of an idea of what it could morph into, and then you go with a story either either online right away or print. Um, you know we do both as quickly as possible. And then you make sure you follow up on it. Well, how did it, in the next day, how did it change? Yeah. Um, did it change at all? Um, and if it did change, then we gotta go with another story. And you just try to try and keep updating it to the reader as much as possible. I think the Great Lakes funding issue is one of those that, that you can do that with pretty well because it's such a big issue and it's gonna always be changing and, and yeah. always happening. But I know at the state level, I mean, we get a dozen press releases a week, there's no way we can do right. a story on every single 
idea that's at a committee level in Lansing, right? Right. So you focus on, you know, I think it's really similar for for our station. We just are constantly updating. And a lot of it, too, is right before air, make that last call. Like, is it still this way before I go put this on TV? Right. So, you know, just constantly calling and updating. We do a ton of update stories. So with, with everything, local, state, national. So it's just, it is, it's a constant update. And you really have to utilize your sources to be able to figure out which proposals actually have legs or not. And that's, that's where having a good reporter who has really good sources comes in very handy. Because there, there are there are a lot of proposals that go to committee, and you know a majority of them are not going to pa pass through committee. Well, used to be a majority of them are <laughs> not passed through committee, but lately it seems like everything's gone through. Um, so, you know, you... you you use your sources. You know, which one of these? Which of the, which of these proposals are serious, and they're really going to move through committee, and, mm -hmm. and they, they really have the legs. Or, on the flip side, you know, you've got all these proposals. Which do you think are going to be the most interesting to your area? The, have the most impact in your area? It may not have legs. It may it may die in committee, but you still should be. You still should tell your readers about it because this is something that your your elected leaders are talking about. That has an impact on you, and it may it may die in committee, but they're still talking about. It. That means there's an idea of that down in Lansing, out in Washington D.C. that you yeah. still should let your readers or your viewers know about. So we still try and tell them. That's for that's for you know anything we think that that would have an impact on them locally. You know, there's a lot of national or statewide issues, like issues that out of out of Lansing that would that would just impact the Detroit area that are in committee. You don't see us reporting on it too right. much because this doesn't have. It really doesn't have much impact in, in, in Northern Michigan, mm -hmm. but the wolf issue when it first started up, you know, and when it first was first in committee, we were reporting on that right away because we knew first of all we knew it was going to have legs, and secondly we knew it would have a big impact on, on Northern Michigan. Um, so that's how we look at it. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, you know a lot of those stories too that I guess you do have to make that distinction in the decision of what to cover and what not to cover. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there are so many things just always brewing. And I think uh, a lot of it can change, too, with your sources. I had a, a state lawmaker tell me the other day, um, you know, transportation, there's probably going to be something happening this week in transportation. We'll probably get funding passed for roads, and it's going to probably happen tomorrow. I'll give you a call. Well, that was three days ago, and it just never happened. So it's always that hesitation of uh, at what point do we start reporting. Right. Uh, and in your case, and in our case, it's valuable airtime seconds that you have to decide uh, whether or not we're going to devote anything to it. Uh, so that's always a challenge, too, I think. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the other fun events up in, uh, in your neck of the woods, the Venetian Festival, the, Potosky, or the Charlevoix Venetian Festival uh, this past week. And maybe we'll transition into other festival fun as well. But What's, uh, what's new at Venetian this year? What did you hear about uh, how things went? Well, Venetian has always been a celebration of the water uh, in Charlevoix. And it was very appropriate that it was a celebration of, of the water, uh, considering how much rain that they got <laughs> this year. <laughs> um, they had to postpone a lot of the weekend events over, over the weekend, the fireworks and such, because of rain. Um, but I thought they did a, a really good job in trying to, you know, to let the public know this fire, these fires have been postponed until Saturday, and these fireworks and events have been postponed until Sunday. But you know, they got the word out pretty quickly. Um, so it was, I mean, it was it was a rainy, cold Venetian festival. But from what we're hearing is that it was uh, the tenants of the festival was on par with it ha with with previous years, if not higher, especially on Kids Day, which was on last Thursday. Um, that there was, I think, I believe. I believe uh, they said it was about a thousand children in East Park, downtown Charlevoix, mm -hmm. on Kids Day, and that's 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 a lot of kids. And they didn't have to like walk around a fireplace down there, so there was no <laughs> no problem. No, in there East was Park. A, there was no <laughs> there was no fireplace. <laughs> they had to walk around or anything yeah. like that. Um, uh, it, you know, it seemed like everything was moving pretty smoothly as usual for Venetian Festival. The other bunch of old pros down there running Venetian Festival, yeah. so uh, they, things move pretty smoothly now. I guess the, the closing thought or, or question I want to ask both of you guys is this is festival time all over mm -hmm. northern Michigan. There's something every week. There's usually multiple things every week. We just had Venetian Festival, Cherry Festival, Film Festival, Alpen Harbor Fest. Days, Alpen Fest, Harbor Days in Oak Rapids is this weekend. Do you like this time of year uh, or after 
the fourth day of the uh, pistachio <laughs> festival are you are you kind of burned out I already know what you're I get burned about. out I, I think well lucky if I stay on you know if I'm on the night shift it's a lot easier for me because I kind of stick more to hard news uh, I our day side reporters though that's all it, it's just all festival all the time and we were just talking about this in our newsroom the other day that the film fest is the fourth one we've hard hard covered this year just constantly there so it's fun for a while and then I think it just gets to kind of be like where's the news where's the hard news you know yeah. things like that it's just kind of it just burns you out there's so many people and you know if you're standing down there in the middle of all of it trying to do live shots it can get a little overwhelming I think but I mean it's fun we should mix it up. We should have you do down there doing a live shot yeah. for 9 and 10, Jeremy. Uh, so I got switch. a face for newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what's your, what's your take on uh, all the festival fun up there? Well, <laughs> it's, it's... It takes up a lot of space it, in the yeah, paper. It takes up a lot of space in paper. It takes up a lot of space online. And, I mean, it's, it's a good thing. You yeah. know, it's a lot of great news and a lot of great pictures. I love all the pictures and the videos we get out of it. Um, it's been particularly difficult for us this year with all the festivals because I'm actually short-staffed in my newsroom. Um, we, we lost a few people who, who've moved on in their careers. Um, I'm very happy for it that they've, they've moved on in their careers. But <laughs> at the same time, we're hurting. <laughs> so yeah. we've, uh, we've had to, because not only do we have the festivals that we have to cover, but it seems like every single organization and group has their fundraisers this time of year, yeah. and every single one of them feels as though, and they and they rightly feel this way, that their fundraiser is the biggest thing that needs to be covered, and they want coverage. Why can't you send a photographer, or reporter out to do a story on us? It's easy. We're only ten minutes away. Yeah, we're only ten minutes away, but you know we've had to. We this summer we've had to tell people you know we we just don't have the staff. To, to send to every single fundraiser golf outing uh, this summer. You know, take some photographs, if you could yourself, send them in to us. We'll put it in the paper, we'll put it up online, but we just don't have staff to do it this year. Yeah. So that's how we, we've had, that's how we've had to, we've had to cover things this year is really focus on the truly big community events. And not to say that the fundraisers aren't big, you know, a lot of them are big, but you know, we, we've, We've had to pick and choose a lot. It's hard to get stuff. to everything. It's yeah. just, it's not possible sometimes. And people, their feelings get hurt. Yeah. Because, you, know, you can't get there, but yeah. I hope, please, understand. <laughs> <laughs> Make your plea to the camera right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're trying. We're trying. You know, <laughs> just, if we can't get to you, send us a photograph and a little information about it. I'll put it in the paper. <laughs> and the other, the hard part about that, too, is you open this can of worms that once you cover... Uh, fundraiser A, why aren't you covering fundraiser right. B? Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. we went through, when I was at uh, 7 and 4 several years ago, we almost had this unwritten rule, we're just not going to cover any golf fundraisers, no matter what, for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. No golf outings because there's one three times a all month. All the time, yeah. You know, we just, we can't do it all. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the, how good the, uh, the the cause is or whatever, there's just too much of mm -hmm. it to do. Yeah. So those are hard. Yeah, they, it is. It's hard. It's I mean, they're fun. They're fun to do sometimes, but they do. They just get a, they get to be a, a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of Especially resources. Especially back yeah. to back like this. <laughs> it's like once a week. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so many photographs of somebody hitting a golf ball yeah. that you can run, or or <laughs> video of right. somebody hitting a golf ball. Uh, you can just pull out the file video and say, "Hey, yeah. we were here this week." Right. We make we make jokes about that, uh, like with uh, the the various um, bicycle rides um, around the area. It's like, oh, look, we have another photograph of somebody riding a bike. Another five K. Last year, <laughs> another five K. Five K. Yeah, yeah. There's lots yeah. of those too. But we still like to, we we like to get those photographs. But we we like I keep saying we ask people to send them in to us because yeah, it's hard to get out to everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, I want to thank you so much for coming in, Vanessa Face from Nine and Ten News, Jeremy McMain from the Petoskey News Review. Appreciate you being here, and I uh, thank everyone for watching The Briefing Room this week. I'm Bill Fralick from WTCM Radio News, and we'll see you again next week right here.